Well, we're in the process of uh, the, the transition between now and when uh, Congressman Ron Paul comes here. And uh, Ron Paul I've known for 20 plus years. I followed his career as, uh, when he was a congressman from Texas early in his career, followed his career as he was a libertarian. I think I even, I don't know if I should admit this, I think I even got his newsletters. <laughs> His controversial newsletters. Um, he was, um, those newsletters were pretty much like what contemporary blogs are, and uh, he, he had an email uh, uh, a list that included radio talk shows around the country, and I think uh, I was on the air in Cincinnati, Ohio, during the uh, pre-internet newsletter days. So uh, I've known him for a long time and uh, have followed his career for a long time. We have discussed libertarian politics. We've discussed uh, economics for a long time. I've known him for a long time. And, uh, and I think, uh, I, I don't know if the word friend would apply here, but uh, a political acquaintance, and I know the, the people in his sphere of influence, and it's been absolutely intriguing to watch his transition as an obscure Texas congressman who was known as Dr. No. Uh, who's always voting no on almost everything that had to do with money issues. And he says, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. It's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. It got to the point where he was almost the only one in Congress that w was thinking in these terms. Everybody else had pretty much compromised and said, well, I know, it's un technically it's unconstitutional. I know we're not supposed to be doing this stuff, but you sort of have to go along with it. If you want to be effective at all, as a congressman, you sort of have to go along with the, the status quo. And if you want to get good committee assignments, and uh, if you want to not be marginalized, uh, you can't vote uh, like Dr. Paul does, like Ron Paul does. Ron Paul, for 20 years, has stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. And finally, after the uh, multi-wars, the debauching of our currency, and... Uh, a whole generation now in debt, in hawk. It's almost like the next generation is working at this hanging out. That the creepy guy from uh, Texas, the other other signs he voted no. You know, he's starting to make sense. He goes to those debates, the lifetime and the last election cycle. So it was about that he voted at those debates. Uh, he would say the same thing that he'd always been saying, and the other candidates would look down their nose, almost patronizing at Dr. Paul, and created, and, and uh, he sounded, oh, he's just a kook. I don't even know why we allow him in these debates. Uh, events have caught up with Dr. Paul. What was unfashionable and ridiculous uh, now is, seems like it's common sense, and now almost the, uh, most of the candidates, except on foreign policy issues, uh, have adopted <laughs> many of Ron Paul's talking points, and depending on the polls that you look at, he's either one or two here in uh, the state of Iowa, and uh, next week on Tuesday night, uh, it looks like, it varies, according to some of the public opinion surveys, looks like he could win this thing because his organization is state of the art. He is uh, uh, organized right down to the grassroots level, precinct by precinct. The organization that he put in place, or was at least put in place for him in the, during the last election cycle, remains. Uh, and the Ron Paul supporters, and you heard a few of them during the last segment, are zealots. They are it's truly passionate. They have an emotional bond to this candidate. At one level, it's almost spooky, very similar to the emotional bond that Obama supporters had to Obama during the last election. It's amazing that a 77-year-old guy can fill a college campus uh, a room filled with kids, college kids, who think that he is the newest thing, <laughs> the latest thing. But Ron, Ron Paul's message has not uh, uh, changed his message in 25 years, and even longer than that. So we're waiting for him to uh, join us here in the studio, and I hope he didn't get into a fisticuffs uh, uh, contest with uh, Michelle Bachman in the hall, because uh, I don't know who would win that fight.
<laughs> so, anyway, in case you're wondering what the heck we're doing here, uh, my name is Jan Michelson, and I'm the morning show host here at WHO Radio. You're watching us here on C-SPAN. Uh, we are uh, simulcasting here this morning. It's a very informal relationship. We, uh, we understand that we are uh, truly honored as Iowans to be included in the presidential selection process. I saw that Governor Huntsman this morning says, uh, Iowans pick corn. New Hampshire picks candidates. I know that's a cliche that they've been using. We are we take this extremely seriously. I know every talking head says this, uh, but we do. We we ask, try to ask all the right questions. We try to do the pre-interview process of these candidates, uh, so we get the strongest of the candidates sent off to the next states. Good morning, Doc. Okay, right over here, just that your seat's already warmed up. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you brought your granddaughter. Thank you. Lisa. Thanks for coming again. Linda, Lisa, from the High V Studios. And make yourself comfortable. Uh, oops. Okay. I think. Well, you timed that exactly mm. right. <laughs> Guess which book you got me to read? Which one? Currency Wars. Did you like that? Currency Wars? Wow. Well, <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was a little busy here. <laughs> well, we're, he puts it in good context. Okay. Well, well, all right. Welcome back to The Conversation. I'm Jan Michelson, and we are simulcasting with C-SPAN this morning. We're taking as many calls as we can, as quickly as we can. Uh, Congressman Ron Paul has just joined us here in the studio, and this is very informal as it always is. You're used to the cameras, and people are now, uh, you're now, since you're the front runner, um, you're, if people are following you around, you're scribbling down every single morsel that you say, um, as if you're going to say something new after 25 years. <laughs> every, every single morsel I eat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, now that since you are the perceived front runner, uh, they're coming after you big time. I mean, it's uh, they're coming after you because you're the guy on the top. Now you're the guy to take down. Yeah, but they've been a little bit delayed. They've been looking for the flip flops and they've been searching and searching and searching, so they never found any. So they found other things that they are concocting. Well, if you would care to provide them some flip floppery this morning, so we can at least give them something to work with, uh, you're welcome to. Well, some of my flip flops. <laughs> well, you know, I was indecisive today. Should I exercise indoors or outdoors? So I was flip. Plopping back and forth. On so that. the interesting thing about this, uh, friends here in Iowa, usually in December, early January, we're uh, down in the in the teens, in, in the twenties, in, in, on a good day in the lower thirties. We're going to be in the fifties here today, uh, and according to the uh, the talking heads on uh, Tuesday, if it's still weather like this, that will give an advantage to Mitt Romney. Uh, they said that if it were a blizzard and icy conditions, your people, who are much more motivated than those fair weather Romney friend, uh, uh, supporters would, uh, would you guys would take it away with? Well, you know, you know, I think people in the media must be desperate if the temperature is going to determine the future of America and the future of the world. <laughs> uh, so I would say yes, it's something to talk about. Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that, but I would like to think that people and I were more serious about how they make their decisions and where they go and their motivations. I would like to think that too. <laughs> But I haven't convinced you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, were, we were talking about you as you were sitting down. You said, I got you to read a book. What was that? It was Currency Wars by James Ricard. Yeah, he's yeah. really a good economist. and yeah. he, he plays currency war games for currency a living. Wars. And yes. it's a really an interesting book. Do you agree with the assessment that we're in the crossfire in an in, in international currency chess game? Yes, and this is probably a more significant issue than World War II type fighting. I mean, I think that's past. There will be fighting and killing, but the, the, really the battles are, uh, are economic. And this is one of the reasons why I've complained about us spending ourselves into such great debt, because at the same time, the Chinese have the money in the bank, and they're buying up resources. They're buying up resources, but, but then the competition starts. Uh, it's not the potential of a hot war with China, but there's a great potential of a trade war and a currency war and the way we've handled our currency 
currency. It has offended the Chinese. The Chinese are unhappy, and we tell the Chinese what they have to do with their currency. It would all be solved with an international standard of money, such as a backing with gold. You wouldn't have current. You couldn't have currency wars. But you, you just have to have the integrity of co uh, countries uh, obeying the rules of defending their dollar or their currency by something of real value, and you wouldn't have this going on. But this looks like where the real wars are going to go. It'll be through uh, uh, trade and competition and currencies and uh, the likelihood of somebody militarily attacking us you know, in the next hundred years. I mean, we are so powerful. This is one thing that we can brag about. Our military is so strong and we're capable of defending ourselves against anybody. But I really fear the financial time bomb that we're sitting on, the attack that could be on the dollar. Even though the dollar is holding up right now because everybody holds dollars, uh, if push comes to shove in these currency wars, we could be brought down for financial reasons, exactly how the Soviets were brought down. We didn't have to, you know, we were able to contain the Soviets, and they were brought down by economic reasons rather than us needing to fight them. It's interesting, even as we speak, you've got some of these uh, uh, protesters that are over at your office uh, banging on your windows. I didn't uh, even hear that yet. It must not have been a big enough deal yet for them to well, tell me Well, they're just getting it. started. They, they went and did this to, to Romney's office yesterday, and they hauled off a bunch of these things. The, the, the alleged Occupy people are uh, vowing to uh, make a ruckus here in this election cycle and, and disrupt the caucuses. It's, it would really be sad if they did, but there's only like 25 of these people. <laughs> well, and, and, and they have a disordinate uh, amount of media attention, yeah, and now they, now they go over to your office and start to, uh, beating up on your windows and trying to occupy your office. Kind of silly since you're here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> last week, I believe, we had a rally, and people, oh, the staff was more, you know, occupiers are there, occupiers are there, they're in the front row. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Should we call the police? I don't know. Just relax a little bit. Yes. And uh, there, there was no ruckus. And afterwards, I shook a lot of hands. They come up to me and they say, oh, we're from the Occupy movement, but we support you. So I figured that, uh, you know, an, uh, an open viewpoint about the Constitution and freedom and attacking some of the things that they don't like. They don't like the bailouts, and I don't like the bailouts. So there are some things that we can agree on. I think uh, the Tea Party movement and the Occupy movement are motivated for different reasons, but they come together because they don't trust government anymore, and that's why I think I can connect with both groups. Um, it, it looks like uh, if we were in the currency wars, and if you were uh, managing the currency wars, you would have won. Uh, I was. Uh, we've talked about this before, but people have evaluated your portfolio from for as long as uh, you have been in office. You were, you're one of the uh, few uh, members of Congress that refused to take a congressional uh, retirement. You, you, you chose not to invest in right. theirs, uh, and the reason why you did that, for the benefit of our listeners, why you chose that again? Well. I, I consider it unfair. I was complaining about the advantages and the corruption in Washington. Then when they offered me the pension fund, it seemed like too big of a boondoggle, and I, it would have contradicted everything that I was saying, my complaints about what Washington was doing, what Congress was doing, so I turned it down. Well, it's interesting what you did invest in. You're up 547%. Well, that's not too that's, bad. That's a better than Buffett. <laughs> Instead of following Buffett's advice, we should have been following you. 547% over the last 10 years. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm not sure I want my wife to know. She'll want me to spend some of it. People should know that you put your money where your mouth is. You, you've been talking down the fiat currency and the Federal Reserve. And because they were doing what they were doing, you invested in hard currency. You invested in gold and gold shares. Right. You know, in, every once in a while, uh, you know, gold won't go anywhere and stocks will go up. And somebody was sort of at a business station was making fun. They said, just think of all that you missed out by buying gold coins and hold on them. And just look at what you missed out when the stock market was booming. But uh, the stock market boomed for a while, then it went down. But I said, the big difference is, is I decided that the dollar would be devalued drastically after they delinked from gold, which was in 1971 when I started those investments, and gold was $35 an ounce. Uh, today, it's a little bit higher. Yeah, it's about $1,600 yeah. uh, an ounce at the moment. It's been as high as 19 uh, It's It's now flopping around a little bit before it uh, goes back up some more. Yeah. Because the president wants another million, uh, another trillion, trillion, dollars. trillion dollars. Is he likely to get it? You know, the way I understand this, it's he's, he's going to get it. There's no resistance because all he has to do is make a request, and if Congress doesn't act on it, it is automatically given to him. They have to act and turn him down. So he's asked for it during a recess. 
So Congress isn't in session. They don't respond. He automatically, you know, this is the way I understand it. I may do some double checking, but boy, that is something. I believe it's going to be automatic. I think he's going to get it. And that was part of that deal of the the grand compromise to have this super committee. Uh, It looks like a a super sneak attack on the American people by automatically raising the the debt limit uh, in this manner. So uh, we have lots of folks who'd like it in this conversation. Uh, I, I can tell you right now, as you well know, Ron Paul, your organization uh, and the Paulistas, as I call them, <laughs> uh, they are legion and they are active. They are not casual observers of the political marketplace. They are activists. Sometimes you even have to calm them down. Yes, I uh, <laughs> uh, but a lot of folks would like it in this conversation. You have now, because you're now high profile, you have detractors as uh, used to. So they used to ignore you and hope you'd go away. Now that you are running uh, at the top of the pack, now they are digging into your history and they're wondering what he, what did he say back in those uh, uh, those 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 old times? And they're they're digging around in the rubble of your history. Uh, we have lots of uh, people like in on the conversation, and we're simulcasting with uh, C-SPAN, and we'll continue here in a moment on 10:40 WHO Radio. So, so what we do, Ron, is it because we're signed. Oh, oh um, yeah, no, could you? David went and got it. Okay, I've got some in my refrigerator back there. I'm sorry, I didn't have no some. No problem. Um, because we're on C-SPAN, we'll just continue talking through the commercial breaks. If that's okay, we can also take listener calls oh, okay. from all over the the country. All right, we'll, we don't want to waste anybody's time here today. I'm. Try not to get violent this time, and try to try to control your language, okay? Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> We're broadcasting live on uh, C-SPAN, and uh, thank you for your patience, everybody. The C-SPAN has been uh, gracious to allow us to, to do this this morning, and we have the uh, ability to also to simulcast and break away from our normal stuff and to communicate with our audience and take calls during these breaks, too, because I hate dead air, and everybody else does, too. Uh, this is Jaron from Wisconsin. Good morning, Jaron. Good morning. Hi. What would you like us to know? Dr. Paul is listening. I love you. Are you talking to me or Dr. Paul? Everybody. <laughs> I, Wisconsin day. is a loving place, you know. What would you, you have a question for our guest? No, just want to tell you I love you. Well, thank you. Big hug from Wisconsin. Thanks oh, a lot. Oh, <laughs> uh, This is Sam from L.A. Good morning, Sam. Hi, how are you guys Great. this morning? All right, I wanted to ask Dr. Paul, um, a lot of Americans who are uh, going for job interviews these days are often asked to, ask to answer this question, uh, and it's a common uh, interview question, and I would like to uh, have you answer it. Uh, what is your greatest weakness? <laughs> my greatest my greatest weakness? I, I think my <clears throat> greatest weakness is my ability to um, deliver th- a message smoothly. Although I am so convinced about the message of liberty, I think that I can always improve on my delivery. So that's what I work on. I would consider that a weakness. But I get by, you know, in, in presenting the case. But I think it's the strength of the message and the strength of what the Constitution said and what America is all about and how freedom works. Uh, that is my strength. But I would say my weakness is that I could always do better. It's interesting uh, that you talk about that message and to whom it resonates. I was mentioning earlier to a C-SPAN of viewers that uh, that you're filling college campus uh, auditoriums with the next generation. Right. Some of your most ardent supporters are college kids. Why do you think that is? Haven't quite figured it out. I've asked that question to them many, many times. The answer is not always the same. But a lot of times it's, well, you, you like the Constitution. We like people to stand on principle. Uh, we like your issue on the money. It's surprising how many college kids now are interested in the monetary issue. And certainly the foreign policy attracts young people. They, they just uh, don't see the, the benefits of having these endless wars. And when I offer the solution to it is, it's only go to war when we declare war, like the Constitution says. That, that strikes their fancy, too. But I think financially, they realize what terrible shape we're in. They, they know that you know, they could end up paying a lot of money into Social Security, and it's an insolvent uh, program. And I offer a different solution to that and how we can take care of it and tide ourselves over and allow people to get out of it and and they're very attracted to uh, free market economics and and I make a, a big point about personal li- 
liberties. I, I try to connect economic liberty and personal liberties. Most of the time people think personal liberties are separate from economic liberties. But to ha have your right to your life and your liberty and to keep the fruits of your labor is very attractive, and to, especially to young people, but to a lot of other people as well, as well because they're seeing the failure of the dependency on government. When Michelle Bachman was here a few moments ago, she went through a litany. She said, uh, you and, uh, and, and she are on, on the same page when it comes to economics. She would consider herself an Austrian uh, supporter, von Mises and Hazlitt and all those guys. But you depart on foreign policy issues and some of the social issues. She went through, so, oh, he's in favor of legalizing heroin, uh, and he'd be a, a, a pro-abortion uh, <laughs> politician. I had, a, uh, I had a lady call me a couple of afternoons ago. Uh, hang on, let's, let's rejoin the audience here, uh, from our local audience in here in just a moment. Right back to conversation. Michelson here with you is uh, Congressman Ron Paul is here in the studio. We were going through some of the issues uh, that Michelle Bachman raised during the last segment, talking about drug legalization and you would be, uh, in effect, uh, a pro-abortion uh, president. I had a lady uh, call me. In fact, this has happened a couple of times now. This is going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to apologize for what I'm about to say, but these are perceptions that exist. Uh, Ron Paul, when you were a physician, you were an abortionist. That's actually what a lady told me yesterday. You were an abortionist. And I pointed out, uh, just reading the first chapter in your Liberty <laughs> Defined book, that you're one of the most pro-life candidates and articulate uh, pro-life candidates that I've come across. How do those perceptions come about? Well, I'm not even sure they're true perceptions. Sometimes I think uh, it's well, this, propaganda. No, this lady was convinced it was true. <laughs> yeah, well, she just doesn't know me. <laughs> right. And she should. I mean, not only the book that you're quoting, Liberty Defined, but I wrote a whole booklet on the abortion issue, and I've introduced a lot of legislation dealing with abortion. I have one bill that would have uh, repealed Roe versus Wade just with a majority vote. Didn't have to wait for a constitutional amendment. Didn't have to wait to uh, change the Supreme Court. And, and strictly remove the jurisdiction of the abortion issue from the federal government. And I don't get a lot of support for that. If that is the case, if Iowa had a pro-life state where you couldn't do abortions, it couldn't be appealed to the Supreme Court. And that's legal under the Constitution. And when we had the majority in the Congress, we had the House and the Senate and the President, they could have done it by majority vote. And this could have been done 10 years ago. Think how many millions and millions of abortions would have been prevented. But uh, And that would have essentially repealed Roe versus Wade. It wouldn't totally neutralize Well, there's two it. levels to what Ron Paul just said. Uh, it, it, when talking about dealing with issues of uh, judicial supremacy, 20 years ago, you were writing that there were fixes and cures for aberrant Supreme Court rulings that did not require a constitutional amendment. You're way ahead of the curve on that, and people are still not up with that. You, you, people are still saying that Roe versus Wade is the law of the land. It is not, is it? No, because it can it can be reversed. It's not part of the Constitution. It was a ruling by the court for five folks to four, I believe. And and, 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 and courts don't make law. No, they're not. And, and that the way they ruled on that should have never gone to the Supreme Court, but then they did. Then they wrote a lot of law into it. If you read it, it it's a lot of medical management there. You can do this, this, and this, and and uh, it, it was a lot of mischief. No, it it, um, it it doesn't meet muster as far as the okay. Constitution is concerned. Given your strong uh, pro-life uh, philosophy, um, are, have you expressed a, a willingness or unwillingness to sign on to the personhood amendments? Well, I did with qualifications. You know, I've, I've signed it, but uh, I more or less uh, wrote uh, a dissertation like and, and wrote the, some of the exceptions about I don't like to strengthen the Fourth Amendment. I don't want the four, uh, 14th Amendment to repeal the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment. It wasn't meant to do that. So I'm still much in favor. I'm, I support the definition of personhood, but I still think that we should repeal Roe versus the way in the states should deal with this just like they deal with all other acts of violence. Violence. I didn't want to, you know, to, to make the difference. You, your, your critique is that it's an act of violence. Is, does the, uh, from your personal point of view, I know you're a libertarian, but it, uh, it, it, does the preborn have moral status? Does it have theological status? Does it have, should it have legal status? Well, it does, does have it have, legal. Does it have intrinsic value before they're born? It, it does. There, uh, there, there shouldn't be any question about that because uh, if 
uh, if a woman becomes pregnant and the father dies, it still has inheritance rights. At time, of, it, it you know occurs at the time of conception. Uh, if a woman comes to see me the first month or two or three, or I'm taking care of her, and this I forget to ask her whether she's pregnant or not, and I give her a medication that is very detrimental, I can get sued. I sued for this. So uh, yes, it's it's legal and uh, it's a legal entity, and and they want to turn it around. And say, and they'll throw it back to me as a libertarian, you know, I'm very libertarian on personal behavior, and people should be responsible for their own behavior, and then they say, well, why would you get involved w with the woman uh, in her rights to abort, abort a fetus? And, and the answer is that the fetus has a right to choice, too. So it, there is. It's, a, it's an unusual, different, different situation than exists anyplace else. Is because there's two lives involved and it's interconnected. But you could almost make the parallel. We at one time thought our homes were sacred. Our homes were our castle. And government couldn't come in without a search warrant. And, you know, remember the old days. But the, our homes were our castle. Well, what if those babies born in the home? Uh, and the government's not a lot in our home. We never granted saying, well, the baby's a minute old, it doesn't look so healthy, so why don't we just kill the baby? Uh, what's the difference between the value of that life one minute before and one minute after? So I, I say that uh, life is precious and uh, it, it's truly a human being and deserves protection, but there are some complex issues and uh, difficulties, and this is why I think the founders were right in making this a state issue. I know why the, this is, the, I, I didn't mean to totally uh, get onto this particular issue and park it here, but uh, one of the persons who said to you in, in your book where you were 1960, in the 60s, when you were still an intern, you were still a resident. I'm not, right. There's a difference between an intern and a resident, but you were, it says in your book you were a resident. I, in, I was a, yeah. uh, an in, uh, a resident at that time, I believe. Uh, and it says you were visiting a surgical suite you know. as, a, as an OBGYN resident. Uh, abortion of a fetus that weighed approximately two pounds was placed in a bucket, crying and sh struggling to breathe. Uh, the medical personnel pretended not to notice, and soon the baby stopped crying. And so that was a that that helped that moment helped to define your worldview. Yeah, it was profound because that was shortly after I got out of medical school. But the subject of abortion never came up in medical school. It was in the late 50s. It was in the 60s where things changed and actually that occurred uh, probably in about 60. A, uh, no, after 65, that's when I was a resident. Well, the, 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 the hypercritical nature of this has become how can Ron Paul call himself pro-life if, if walking past that, if 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 he did not rescue that uh, that uh, two pound child from that bucket, uh, he's not pro life. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, mean, I would have had to have. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it probably was like a fleeting two minute thing. I walked in, take a peek, and saw what was happening, and then they walked out because we visited different operating rooms. But uh, I didn't have the facilities. What could I have done? You know, it would have been, it would have been. That's all, uh, all I'm pointing out, that's how vitriolic this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, and I think, but uh, people who still have a misperception, all I do is ask people to be open-minded enough to read what I've said and written about over these many, many years. Well, let's talk to as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, and this is David. Good morning. Good morning, David. Good morning, Jan. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. You bet. I, uh, I want to ask a, a very brief question, and if I could have a brief follow-up. Uh, Dr. Paul, um, how confident were you at the time uh, that the newsletters that bore your name uh, were representing your views on taxes, on uh, monetary policy, the Second Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, all the things that you hold dear? How confident were you that the newsletter... Uh, accurately portrayed your views on those things. Well, the news the newsletters uh, were uh, written, you know, a long time ago, and I wrote a, a, a certain portion of them. I would write the economics. So a lot of what you just mentioned, I was this while you're in Congress or between. No, this was in between. It was in it was an investment letter, but. Uh, this would be material that I would turn in, and, and it would become part of the letter. But there were many times when I didn't edit the whole letter, and other things got put in. And, uh, and, and, and then I didn't even really become aware of the details of that until many years later when somebody else
else to call him and say, did you know what was in it? But th these were sentences that were put in. I think it was a total of about eight or ten sentences, and it was bad stuff. It, it, it wasn't reflection of my, my views at all. So it, it got in the letter. I think it was terrible. I was tragic, and, you know, and I had some responsibility for it because the name went out in my letter. But I was, I was not an editor. I'm like a publisher. And if you think about um, publishers of newspapers, every once in a while they get some pretty junky stuff in their newspapers, and they have to say this is not the sentiment and, and the position of that newspaper, and this is certainly the case. But, you know, I actually... I actually put a news, a type of a newsletter out. Uh, it was a Freedom Report, an investment newsletter, survival report, different ways. Every month since 1976. So um, this is probably 10 sentences out of, you know, 10,000 pages for all I know. And But but uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's bad that it happened, but I, uh, you know, disavowed all, all these views. And people who know me best, the people in my district, have heard these stories for years years and years, uh, you know, um, about it, and, and they, they knew they weren't reflection of anything I believed in, and uh, it never hurt me politically, and, but, and right now, I think that is the same case, too. I mean, people but, are desperate to find something. But, Dr. Paul, many of your newsletters are filled with conspiracies. You had one newsletter from start to finish with fear that the, uh, the $50 bill, because it was, be, it was going to be made pink and it was going to have all kinds of things that could track us down. That we should all be, be afraid. We should all be afraid that uh, maybe tomorrow they're going to require us to turn in all of our old money and and. All right. Basically, the, well, the, 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 yeah. co the coin, the paper money now is pink, <laughs> you know. But no, we have not had runaway inflation. I still fear that, but I fear the consequences of uh, of the inflation, which was my concern. And I'm still like just a few minutes ago, we called uh, talked about the currency wars. It's uh, transformed in a different manner. We do not have yet the runaway inflation, but we have the runaway debt and the runaway malinvestment in the collapse of the whole world economy that we're facing today. So, yes, uh, I was very concerned then. I'm probably more concerned now than ever before. So that's why I continue to deal with these economic issues. There was an interesting uh, fact. When people, uh, your people knew that uh, you were going to be on this morning, I got uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of links to a video that uh, your people have produced dealing with the time that you were a physician and this was of a, I don't know, I, I'm assuming you're aware of this, it was a, a, a black fellow from uh, Texas who, whose wife was in uh, distress uh, giving birth uh, in a hospital and having, she was having trouble and they were having trouble finding a doctor who was willing to give them service and by implication because he was black and she was uh, a white lady that she was having trouble finding a, an emergency physician here's the sound of some of this it was uh, between 1972 and 73 but it was still a lot of prejudice around this area my wife was sick and I was trying to get some attention for her. Nobody came to check. They just left her there. Well, I believe I was left there because of the difference, uh, me being black and her being white. And every time I would say something to the head nurse, she would get pretty upset. And then she finally called the uh, Freeport Police Department, said I was harassing her. And I mean, I, I didn't know anything to do. Well, then Ron Paul come to my rescue. He just stepped in and went to work with my wife. And after he seen her, uh, I'd say no more than 10 minutes later, she had a stillborn boy child. And he said, as far as the bill, he would take care of everything, which he did. I never got a bill from the hospital or anything. And, he was a doctor of medicine, and that's what he was doing, was practicing medicine, and it didn't matter who and what and why. He was that was, that's an amazing story. Wow. <laughs> how, how did you, uh, uh, that's a long time ago. How, uh, I'm super, well, how did you, you know, this was, uh, I just saw this a uh, little, little while ago. It wasn't put out by our campaign. It was put out by that, you know, the super PAC type stuff that are separated from the campaign. Okay. I'm amazed at how they found that. If you would have asked me to go back and find somebody like that, I wouldn't know. But 
to me, I don't remember it. I don't recall it because it was one of, you know, just the way we practice medicine, you know, in the way at least I practice Obviously medicine. Obviously, it was so incredibly it was a non- important to that guy. He it was a non- non-event uh, in the sense that that that, I, that is what I thought my responsibilities were, but I never never had the uh, knowledge of how grateful he was, you know. And to me, that's magnificent. After you know? all this time, isn't uh, it? Yeah, because it it uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> so <laughs> we will continue with uh, Dr. Ron Paul, Congressman Ron Paul, presidential candidate here in the middle of Iowa. You're listening to 10:40 WHO Radio, and we're also uh, simulcasting on uh, C-SPAN here this morning. And uh, Mr. Cooper is going to update us on our farm markets. We'll can. Re- Convene in just a moment at 1040 WHO. Okay, now we're back with our C SPAN viewers. I can see that was that kind of an emotional effect on you. Yeah, it did. Um, well, because it's sort you're of not, something out of the past. You're not given to Oprah moments. You almost <laughs> had one, didn't you? <laughs> well, it, it was it was sort of touching thinking about uh, you know, it's sort of one of these things where sometimes you get banged over the head mercilessly and you think, oh, boy, you know, they're making me sound like I'm a terrible person. But I keep telling myself, well, first off, you've invited this problem by being involved in politics. And the other thing is I work on, you know, over the years, you know, and I know you remember I, there were times when I'd vote for, by myself, you know, and trying to make these points. But I keep telling myself truth wins out. Truth wins out in the end. And uh, – I think if I can make mistakes, and, and uh, but if I'm telling the truth, eventually truth comes around. You know, whether it's sound money or the foreign policy or, or whatever, if if you honestly believe it's the truth, and uh, I, I think you'll eventually win. Uh, and in some ways, I, I think we're starting to win some of these fights right now, and uh, the people are starting to listen because our country is in such uh, such dire trouble. It's interesting that you know because of YouTube and the video and the modern technology has so changed the way politics is done. There's no place for anybody to hide anymore. You can't utter a, a word without having somebody record it, and you can't deliver one message to one group of people and then go across town and, and deliver the opposite message anymore and get away with it. You have to be consistent. There's no place to hide. Now, I was doing some uh, some uh, research, and I came across a video that you did on the old Morton Downey show. Oh, do you have to talk about <laughs> Morton Downey? <laughs> and you, I, I was stunned to watch him get in your face and blow smoke in your oh. face and called you every name in the book, and you just sat there taking this stuff. Uh, he was, and it, and it goes into what, the, what, uh, what Michelle Bachman said during in the last hour, if you elect Ron Paul, you're going to have legalized heroin. In yeah. the, in the, and so, how do you deal with that? Those issues. Well, that's what we had before 1914, and, and the country survived. But it wasn't legalized in the sense that there were no restrictions; they, they right. were just put on by uh, by the states. So uh, it's it's a different approach. Uh, we we alcohol is a very very dangerous drug, and they tried prohibition. <laughs> it was a terrible decade. Right. They still drank. Uh, the country drank, and they drank bad liquor at times, and people got sick from. It. And finally, uh, conventional wisdom, the status quo, said, well, we like, we like alcohol, but we don't like marijuana, so we have to imprison people who are in marijuana. Now, what happened? After 1914, uh, there were all different reasons why they wanted to make, make them legal. It gave more power to the medical profession. But for some reason or other, they decided that everything except alcohol would be uh, a, 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 cr- a, a crime rather than a disease. Today, we treat alcoholism as a disease. Disease. But if, you, if you're hooked on another drug, uh, then you're a criminal. I don't think it solves a bit of the problem. It hasn't worked. We spent trillions of dollars on this. It undermines our personal liberties. We have these breakdown doors in the wrong apartments, and people get killed over these things. And, and the tragedy we have on our southern border has a lot to do with drugs. 45,000 people have, uh, have, have died on our borders uh, uh, in, in recent years. Well, some people also misunderstand a part of the libertarian message. Well, the first half is you have freedom to be stupid. Uh, but the other half is uh, the rest of us don't, shouldn't have to pay your bills. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you let people get for total freedom, but you take away the safety net, and so you don't go around catching people. Should I, should I grab one here? 
Or, or we have just uh, one minute? Okay. All right. We're, we're coming down in the countdown. We're, we're simulcasting on uh, CNN here. I checked that C-SPAN here this morning. I didn't mean to scare anybody. <laughs> and we're talking with uh, Congressman Ron Paul. Dr. Paul is here in the studios, and lots of us are uh, eager to ask him a bunch of questions. Uh, before we do anything else, and I promise uh, those of you who are on the line, I'll get to you here in just a second. Uh, as you well know, proxies for other candidates are all over the place, and one of them that was a proxy for Newt Gingrich the other day uh, said something, and I considered it a personal attack against you. So I would like to give you the opportunity to respond, if, if that's okay. It wasn't just that he disagreed with your policies. Mm -hmm. It was an attack uh, on your integrity. Uh, and this congressman, uh, former congressman Greg Gansky, who is uh, here, and he's, he's proxying for uh, Newt today. Um, and here's what he said. Ron is accusing the speaker of being a hypocrite. I mean, that's how he ends this last ad. Well, look, when, when I was in Congress with Ron, he used to put in, he would put in hundreds of millions of dollars of appropriations requests, earmarks, okay? And then he would sit on the floor and he would wait until the vote was certain that his earmarks would be funded. And then he would put his card in the slot and vote no. So that he could then say with purity, okay, I don't vote for earmarks. But there's this hundred of millions of requests that were honored by Republican appropriators. But, but then, you know, he doesn't complete the deal. He'd vote against the budget. He'd vote against his own earmarks, so knowing that they were going to pass so that he was going to get it so he could have then have his cake and eat it too. All right, respond any way you'd like. It's amazing how people change when they become spokesmen for other people. <laughs> Greg has always been a friend, a fellow physician. And we were good friends in the Congress, but now, of course, you know, there's a sort of, he's sort of in an at attack mode. But he's completely wrong. Uh, I don't know how it's polite to say that people are, you know, doing a little bit more than just being wrong. He's completely... Here in Iowa, we just say they're full of Shinola. Yeah, well, that's not too bad. <laughs> 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 but but the thing of right. it is, I think this is Paul Pig. But let me let me tell there. This is important because I yes. take on a lot of people on the earmarks. Now he's completely wrong, and I don't know whether he does it deliberately or not. But everybody knows I vote no, and I'm the first one up there, and I vote no on every appropriation bill since I've been there. So I've never voted for uh, an earmark. So it's sort of your default position. Do no, you, it, isn't, it isn't that I ask for it. If, if it gets passed, then I vote for it. That is just gobbledygook. Um, but on, on the other hand, I do support the principle of Congress earmarking. I call it designation. Not only do I think it's right to do that, I think every penny should be designated. They don't call these guys that, you know, are harping on me about earmark. If you had an earmark for an embassy in Baghdad or an airplane that's being built in their district, that's not considered an earmark. Earmarks are usually what you make requests. People come because they take our money from our districts. They take our money from, you know, for highway funds. And they're supposed to give it back for our highway fund. And you just have a request for a highway. You mark it down and you send it in. It's sort of a routine thing. You never lobbied. I just said, they have a right to request some of their money back. But Congress, if they vote down an earmark, you don't save a penny. What happens is that money goes to the executive branch. The executive branch then decides. Then you have to crawl to the executive branch and say, hey, can I have some of my money back to build a highway in my district? Okay, I'll do that as long as you vote for this weapon system that we don't need so we can support the military industrial complex. Then that's a big trade-off. So no, every penny should be designated by the, uh, by the Congress. And right now, of course, money flows to the executive branch. Obama didn't come and ask for money to to invade or get involved in, in, in Libya. And uh, he's right now, the plans are being made to go into Syria. He's probably already very much involved. They, they didn't ask for a designation there. That is the same principle. But Congress should act on their own responsibilities and, and not deliver these powers to the executive branch. Let's talk to some folks. And this is uh, Julio. Or Julio. Uh, Julio, yes. Uh, I'm here in... Uh Chicago. Congressman Paul, it's always great to speak with you. Uh, just a quick comment. I studied broadcasting in college at the Western Illinois University in Macomb, and just to see the lack of journalistic integrity from, you know, small-time bloggers like in Illinois, Warner Todd Hudson calling Ron Paul supporters 
racists and Jew haters to Chris Wallace of Fox News to say that if Ron Paul were to win the Iowa caucuses, it would mean nothing. I think that I hope people truly do their own research, turn off the TV, and, and do their own research on candidates because it's clear just by the way they've been attacking you, Congressman Paul, that, uh, you know, it, there's no journalistic integrity <laughs> through the media. Uh, two quick questions. I'll be brief. Number one, uh, in terms of the economic war, the currency war, I'm 22 years old. I'm already investing in physical silver. And I think that uh, I did research on John F. Kennedy's executive order 1110. And, you know, I hear when you talk about going back to the gold standard, well, people look at the price of gold per ounce, 12 or 15, 16, over $1,700, silver at $30 an ounce. How important, how quickly can we get our currency back to where it once was by going back to a gold standard? All right, good. Okay, you, you can't do it very quickly, and you can't do it at all unless the people change their minds about what the role of government ought to be. They have to have respect for the Constitution. The law says you can use only gold and silver as legal tender. You cannot maintain the welfare state, and you cannot police the world because that requires a lot of money, more money than what we have. We can't tax the people to pay for it. Soon, uh, they, people won't loan us money. Matter of fact, they don't, and that's why we have to print it. So the people's minds and attitudes have to change. That's why I talk so much about the purpose of government as f protecting of liberty, but not to do these other things. But if we did these things, and this is where I'm encouraged, because a lot of people are joining me. The young people are recognizing that they're better off if government would be limited. And if under those cases, we could restore a gold standard. We did it once after the Civil War. We were off gold from 1861 to 1878, and there was a three-year transition period from 75 to 78, and it worked. But we weren't running up deficits like this. We weren't printing money. They quit printing the greenbacks. They had greenbacks then, and that's why they had to go off the gold standard. So it can be done, but instead of thinking, can, can we wave a wand and do it immediately, all I want to do is legalize the Constitution and compete with the paper currency. I think that would take care of itself because people would then would give up on the paper. This is not a, a new position for Dr. Paul. He's been saying this for a long time. In fact, I think it was in the 80s you uh, were involved in a gold commission and you wrote a book, a very fine history on the uh, history of gold and gold currency and real money in this country. It still is a good primer on our own history. Most of us were never taught. It's called, I recommend it highly, it's called a case for gold, mm -hmm. little paperback. You can get up there and inform yourself on this. Uh, Thank you for your call, sir. Uh, this is Sharon. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning. Oops. Whoops. Got to put him back on, I think. We got a little bit of feedback. That's all right. We got to... Uh, thank you for your call, sir. Uh, this is Sharon. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning. Oops. Whoops. Got to put him back on, I think. We got a little bit of feedback. That's all right. We got to... All right. There we go. Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to say, as an African-American woman who has been voting with the Democrats, that I am so happy to hear a candidate address the issues that are really important to the majority of the country. We should not be policing the world when we're going broke. And the Federal Reserve Bank should be reined in. And I'm so happy to have a candidate who is speaking to these particular issues in addition to other ones. So I just want to say that I love you, Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. And if Ron Paul is the candidate for the Republicans, I'm switching my vote. All right. Hey, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. You know, and I, this, this is an important point because she brings up the subject of the spending and the overseas spending and the wars. And... Sometimes on our debates, they'll say, we're going to discuss foreign policy, but not economics, or we're going to study, talk about economics, not foreign policy. But the truth is, they have to be connected, because even Mises, the great Austrian economist, said war is a real detriment and always drains and hurts the economy. So people who say sometimes that they agree with me on economic issues, but not foreign policy, don't quite understand economics, and they don't understand foreign policy. The foreign policy is connected. It's the excessive spending. If every penny comes 
out of the economy. And I make the immediate point by saying, if we could just bring back our troops, just think of them spending all that money here versus spending it in Germany and Japan and Korea. That could give us a little economic boost. And, and But the policies do have to be changed. And uh, we have accumulated over $4 trillion worth of debt in these last 10 years on wars that I firmly believe have not served our interest in one way. We need to take a short time out. We're broadcasting uh, live with a simulcast with C-SPAN here this morning. I'm Jan Michelson. As you're uh, tuning in here this morning, you're uh, watching uh, uh, Congressman Ron Paul, who's been a frequent guest in this election cycle. Uh, as you can uh, detect, we have pretty much have these similar conversations <laughs> uh, because we share a common affinity to honor for honest currency and uh, a limited government philosophy. Uh, that used to uh, define what uh, uh, the Iowa Republican Party or the conservatives or the Tea Party or however you want to designate the, uh, the folks in this election cycle. And, and uh, he's, he is wooing and trying to woo those people on that side of the aisle as well as uh, several other candidates. We'll continue in a moment on 1040 WHO Radio. Okay. Uh, Congressman Ron Paul, I'm getting emails from uh, C-SPAN viewers. One was uh, adamant in boldest letters possible on my iPad. Ask Ron Paul <laughs> <laughs> if he will end the ethanol mandates. Now, you're in Iowa, and you want to open a vein now or what? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, end, <laughs> I'd, end, I'd end mandate. I don't like mandates at all. I don't like them on Obamacare. Why should I like them on mandating uh, what producers of gasoline should do? So, uh, yes, I think that that would be a, a, a good idea. I mean, I think ethanol quite possibly has a role to play. It's not been proven yet. But if you want to be competitive, you if you want to, I'm, I'm not against tax credits. I'm for tax credits for everybody or anybody. But they should be given to everybody equally. So uh, maybe... Uh, if, if people would look at it that way. But mandates mean that you have to have a certain percentage and also yeah. the protection that all of a sudden if you can import ethanol at a cheaper rate, why punish the consumer? Why push the gasoline price up 5 or 10 cents if you can get hmm. ethanol cheaper? That's why the marketplace should determine this. The market always pr takes care of the consumer, not the businessman, not labor. And uh, if we understood what the slogan means, the consumer is king, then I think it would be a lot um, easier to understand exactly how the marketplace uh, it, operates. It's interesting that the people usually ask the question, get rid of the subsidies. Well, the subsidies, which was a blender's credit, is, is going away in Anyway, the mandate to use it was uh, uh, partly because the EPA had to replace um, uh, 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 the Hydrocar MBTAEs yeah. with something to uh, as an oxygenant, and they chose ethanol. Now, if you get rid of the mandate, what, what will they uh, to use uh, ethanol as an oxygenant? You got to have. I mean, that's why it was it was an EPA uh, mandate. It would be the price that would determine what we use, and if there's a shortage of fuel and you need ethanol, I mean Brazil uses a lot of ethanol, but they make it. From sugar cane. Yeah, but they are also they they're actually importing it from us. It's we don't have to protect them ourselves from that. They they have a shortage at the moment in Brazil. But, but they do manufacture a lot. And, yes, and, they do. And sugar. They use a lot more than I think most any other country, yes. and they make a lot from sugar cane. All right, that's uh, that's the inside baseball here for Iowans. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for your your call uh, or your your email, uh, sir. Uh, this is Ed. Whoops. Oops, I'm sorry. I think I hit the wrong one. Uh, maybe not. Oh, this is Roy in San Bernardino. Good morning, Roy. Yes, uh, it's an honor to talk to you, Dr. Paul. Uh, I'm a seriously ill cannabis patient in California. Um, voters gave us the right to safe access of uh, cannabis, and yet the Obama administration not only considers me a criminal when I have no record, They've actually taken away my Second Amendment rights, and they give automatic weapons to the Mexican drug cartels. <laughs> now, the ingestion of cannabis in itself has never killed anyone, but the laws against it do. Dispensary owners like Joe Grumbine are being needlessly prosecuted. All right, so just the generic yes, issue. And, and he's, he's dealing with people who enforce laws, and they call themselves compassionate conservatives. I am a physician. I do not think it's part of my compassionate nature is to prevent people from taking something they can grow in their backyard and make them feel much better. It helps people, helps people who are on chemotherapy and, and other diseases. But it should be freedom of choice. And uh, we shouldn't have the federal government overruling state law if we understand the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment. Uh, so it's time to uh, declare a truce or a victory or surrender in the drug war. 
We should uh, we should surrender. It has totally failed. It, it violates all precepts of the Constitution and the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, and it it doesn't work. And uh, we should allow people to make their own choices. We make people allow people to make their own choices to deal with their spiritual hereafter and their intellectual life. Why can't we say that people? can deal with their own bodies. Uh, Rejoining the uh, WHO listening audience with our C-SPAN audience. Later we'll have some open line time uh, with our uh, audience from all over the country. You're welcome to give us some feedback on what you've heard so far. This We can have a nationwide caucus this way. Just a few moments remaining with our in-studio guest, Dr. Ron Paul. Um, This is Joel. Good morning. Is it Joel or Joel? Joel. Okay, good morning. What would you like us to know? Um, well, I just I just want to uh, to say a quick comment on on how the uh, the uh, Medicaid and Social Security situation um, is going on right now. Um, Dr. Pa- um, Ron Paul, he said uh, that um, he'd take care of those situations. It's very understandable for me, but there's a lot of people that are depending from those uh, programs that do not understand what Paul is um, uh, referring to. I would just like them to uh, like him to clarify that, and um, I just want to ask him what would he do over here and in, in when he gets to uh, Florida, South Carolina, uh, concerning the fact that uh, most of these states down south voted for uh, Obama. It's interesting. Let me build on his question here. Uh, you're likely to do very well on uh, Tuesday night. Some say you're likely to win it. Uh, if if not, it'd be a very close uh, race. Um, can you duplicate? your success here in Iowa in other parts of the country and and, and embellish the Florida issue? Well, I would have to assume that's that's a possibility. I don't think the numbers are there. I was able to convince people in my district over the years on this philosophy of liberty and the Constitution, and we're doing very well here. Then the next chore would be in New Hampshire to do very well there. Uh, And the message is a powerful message. So I I think there's a very good chance that we can do exactly that. Uh, Have you... What was his question about Florida specifically? Um, it was a technical question. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Joel, re- re- help me understand what your your position there, your your question in Florida was. Are you still there? Uh, it wasn't Florida? Yeah. Well, my my question is since there's a whole bunch, uh, there's a lot of Hispanics and uh, and uh, and blacks in in in, in uh, Florida. Yes. How can you do, do and go after the Obama See, I, I don't see people in groups. I, I don't think we should give special privileges or any penalties in groups. So whether they're Hispanics or blacks or whites or whatever, everybody should love freedom because freedom means we're going to leave you alone and that you can keep the fruits of your labor and nobody's to tell you what to do and you have equal justice in the courts. These drug laws are so biased against the minorities. If you think about it, it's the probably one of the worst things left in racism in our in our country because if you look at the numbers the minorities are overwhelmingly punished by the drug laws and also overwhelmingly punished with the death penalty poor minorities are more likely to receive the death penalty than whites with just a few seconds remaining uh, dr paul what would you like us to know more than anything else well that Liberty is the answer. America is a great country, but we've lost our way. We need to just look to our past, and we can find the answers to many of our problems. Believe in the Constitution. Believe in the rule of law. Thank you, sir. Okay, and you are uh, to join us. Uh, okay, we're we're off with our local audience, where we got a couple more seconds to chat here. How do you predict you're going to do on Tuesday? Well. <laughs> no, you, we're going to do real well, but I'm not going to say, oh, I know I'm going to win, and I know what the percentages are. But everything that we've done seems to have uh, been built with momentum. You know, there was no sudden blips up yeah. or down. And uh, and one thing that most people have given us credit for, you know, if you become a supporter of the philosophy that I talk about, they usually stick with us. You know, they don't come and go. So these numbers are up there. They're up near the top right now, if not at the top. So we don't suspect that all of a sudden say, oh, well, we looked at him, and uh, we're going to change our mind again. I think they're going to stick with us. What about the, uh, the no, uh, last, year, last time around, you had a very organized and very passionate base, too. Uh, is it, uh, on the basis of your assessment this time, do you have more volunteers, more money, 
a, a, a even better organization, or is it just the equivalent organization with a, a different cycle? No, we have the same candidate and the same same message, but the organization is much different. It's much much bigger. Fundraising is much easier. Many many more volunteers. But the big thing is the country has changed. Now, four years ago, people weren't you know with me on getting out of Afghanistan. There were some, but now it's overwhelming. Seventy percent of the people say we've had enough of Afghanistan. And they're much more frightened about the economy. And I've been talking about that for 30 years and warning about it. So I would say the country has come around to mandating looking at another option. And that's why they're giving me some time. Yeah, like and, Dick uh, Morris, uh, in essence, the other day said that uh, a vote for you is a vote for Obama. And literally, because your policies and some of these issues are identical uh, on the foreign policy. No, I think Obama too often and <laughs> follow some of the Republican viewpoints, so yes, they're going to be different. But I, I want to follow the Constitution and, and the advice of the founders and have a non-intervention foreign policy. Uh, no, the establishment of either party, neither party will talk about the Federal Reserve in a, in a serious manner or bringing troops home or uh, looking at the change in the tax code or ca actually cutting anything. There's no yeah. serious effort to cut anything uh, other than the one we have proposed in this campaign. Now, last time we chat, we talked about the uh, Federal Reserve and Fort Knox and where our gold actually physically is. Uh, have you ever have you thought about another uh, uh, just walk through and go visit? They haven't done this since the 50s. Right. So can you as a member of Congress say, hey, I want to go see the gold. Do you have the clout to do that? I'm not sure. I should test it. And uh, maybe after next Wednesday I w or next Tuesday, I won't have to be coming into Iowa quite as often. <laughs> maybe I can go to Fort Knox and check that out. <laughs> hey, thank you for coming by, sir. You're welcome. You spend some extra time with us Fine. here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not exactly. Hey, thank you. You can just uh, file out, and these guys will probably follow you, too. And when <laughs> we're in the middle of a, a network news break here at the, at the top of the hour, and we usually rejoin our local people about 7 after the, hey, Dr. Paul. Thank you, indeed. Hey. If I don't get a chance to see you Great again, to see you. it's been a delight. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs>